I want to thank you all for coming today uh, and spending your day talking about something which I'm sure we all understood before we got into the room was not going to be particularly pleasant to talk about. Thank you. Um, Daryl talked about some very important steps that need to be taken to lessen the risk that we face right now. I want to talk a little bit about that, but I want to focus on the need for us to move very quickly to a very fundamental change in our nuclear policy that goes beyond these risk reduction steps and embraces in, uh, a vision that's totally different than the one which guides U.S. security policy today. Our national policy is based on the assumption that we're going to maintain a nuclear arsenal forever. And I would argue that that policy poses an unacceptable risk to all life on this planet and that we need to move very quickly not to get rid of all the nuclear weapons, that's going to take a bit of time to dismantle them all, but very quickly to a national commitment that we are going to accept a fundamentally different policy, one which recognizes that the existence of these weapons are the greatest threat to our security, and which commits us to get rid getting rid of these weapons once and for all. A generation ago, we all understood this. People of my age who were politically active in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, knew every day that we woke up that it was a gift, that we hadn't been in nuclear war during the night. And that understanding of the immediacy of the danger propelled enormous amounts of political activism. Millions of people in the United States, in Europe, even in the Soviet Union, in Japan, in Australia, active, demanding that the Cold War arms race end. And that political activity was successful we went from a situation where Ronald Reagan was inaugurated in January of 1981 as the most hawkish president we'd ever had with regards to nuclear weapons, committed to developing the ability to fight and win, his words, a nuclear war, to within three years a situation where the United States acknowledged that nuclear war could never be won and therefore must never be fought. It was an unbelievably profound transformation of US policy that took place in a very short period of time in response to enormous public pressure. And that's what we need to do again. The problem that we face today is that people do not understand in large numbers either the immediacy of the threat or the enormity of the threat. And if we're going to rescue ourselves, if we're going to get ourselves out of this incredibly dangerous spot that we are now in, we need to create a broad public understanding of those two factors, the immediacy and the enormity of the threat, and we also need to give people a roadmap, a path that they can follow to get rid of these weapons. So let me talk for just a couple of minutes uh, in uh, continuing the, some of the themes that Daryl developed about the immediacy of the threat. Daryl has talked about North Korea and Russia, US relations with these two countries, and the great danger posed by both of those sets of relations. There are two other geopolitical areas that I think we also need to worry about. US-China. U.S.-Chinese relations are the worst they've been in 40 years. Uh, China, in the closing years of the Cold War, was essentially a, an honorary member of NATO, an ally in the U.S. Uh, effort to contain the Soviet Union. That's not true anymore. We have what is at best a competitive and at worst an adversarial relationship with China, and this relationship is not getting better. And there's a military dimension to that. The U.S. and China uh, naval forces engage in exercises in the South China Sea part of which exercises not infrequently involve games of chicken with US and Chinese uh, warships, uh, sort of seeing who can, who can scare the other one into changing course. This is a very dangerous situation. It could lead to military conflict. And as Daryl's slide illustrated, conflict between the United States and China would involve enormous numbers of nuclear weapons if that happened. The other geopolitical situation that we need to pay attention to, and which gets almost no attention here in the United States, is the extraordinarily dangerous situation in South Asia. India and Pakistan have fought four wars. There is low-level fighting on their border in Kashmir almost every single day. And no one who follows events there closely would be at all surprised if one day, perhaps today, perhaps tomorrow, that low-level fighting escalated out of control into another conflict, another large-scale war. Between them, India and Pakistan have almost 300 nuclear warheads. And the next war in South Asia, if there is one, will almost certainly be a nuclear war. 
So US Russia, US China, US North Korea, India Pakistan, four potential geographic flashpoints. There are three other factors which I think we need to consider in assessing the imminency, the immediacy rather, of the nuclear danger. One is something we don't think about a whole lot, and that's climate change. The United States, Russia, the other nuclear weapons countries have been telling us for decades that they really do want to get rid of the nuclear weapons, but they can't do it right now. The situation is too dangerous in the world. We have to wait until things are better. Well, things are not getting better. Climate change is making this a more and more dangerous place. And as climate change continues over the coming decades, and it will, even if we do all the things that we are supposed to do right now, large portions of this planet are going to become unable to support their current populations, let alone the projected population growth in those areas. And as that happens, the potential for conflict is going to grow dramatically. And if nuclear weapons are still on the table, the danger of nuclear war is going to grow dramatically as well. Another factor that we need to worry about, cyber terrorism. We used to think that the greatest threat that terrorists posed with regards to nuclear weapons was the possibility that they might get their hands on a single nuclear device, maybe they'd build their own after getting hold of some fissile material, and be able to blow up one city, New York or Moscow or Tel Aviv or Bombay. It would be terrible, and that threat still exists. But we now understand that there is an even greater threat posed by terrorists, and that is the possibility that they would carry out a cyber attack on the command and control centers of the United States or Russia or one of the other nuclear weapon states and either cause the direct launch of that country's nuclear weapons, or more likely, create a false alert, create the impression in the country that was being hacked that it was actually under nuclear attack, and lead that country to launch its own nuclear weapons in retaliation, according to the policies which all the nuclear weapon states have in place of launch on warning. The final factor is one that Daryl also alluded to, and that's the Trump presidency. And I, I, this is something I find some difficulty talking about because I think we need to approach this in a bipartisan spirit. And I, I want to emphasize this is not a partisan comment. It is the security experts in the president's own party who have established and said publicly, repeatedly, that this man lacks the knowledge, the temperament, and the judgment to command nuclear weapons. We said for decades here in the United States that it was impermissible for even a single nuclear weapon to fall into the wrong hands, by which we meant a rogue state or a terrorist group. We have turned over 6,800 nuclear warheads to Donald Trump's hands, which I think many would argue, with great justification, are totally inappropriate hands to control a nuclear arsenal. We have argued, PSR, that no human being should ever have the ability to destroy this planet. There are some people who we trust with that authority even more. And we've elected one of them president of the United States. And we need to deal with the consequences of that decision. As long as he is president, the danger of uh, nuclear war is even greater than it has been previously. So given the scope of this danger, what's going to happen if these weapons are used? Uh, we used to think that only a large-scale war between the United States and the Soviet Union would threaten the world as a whole. We now understand that a much more limited nuclear war as might take place between India and Pakistan, would also be a disaster for the entire planet. The studies that have been done over the last few decades have shown that as few as 100 Hiroshima-sized bombs would cause, if detonated over industrial urban targets, would put enough soot into the upper atmosphere to cause worldwide climate disruption, that would drop temperatures across the planet, cut down the sunlight needed for plant growth, shorten the growing season, and as a result of this global climate disruption, there would be a worldwide famine that would put up to 2 billion people at risk of starvation. An event of this magnitude is unprecedented in human history. Even if 2 billion people died, it would not be the extinction of our species, but it would be the end of civilization as we know it. No civilization in history has ever withstood a shock of this magnitude. And there is no reason to think that the very fragile complex, interrelated economic system, which we all depend on, would survive a shock of this scale. That's a limited nuclear war. What happens if there's a large-scale nuclear war? Let me very briefly describe the effects 
that we would see in a modern attack on a city. We have images in our head of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These disasters are very important warnings about the power of nuclear weapons. But the main thing we need to know about Hiroshima and Nagasaki is that they do not begin to prepare us for the scale of the destruction that would result with a modern nuclear attack. We don't know the exact targeting strategy of either the United States or Russia, although I have been told by someone who's fairly authoritative that the United States continues to target Moscow with over 100 nuclear warheads. Uh, the model that I use assumes that a large city like New York would be targeted with perhaps 15 to 20 nuclear warheads. And to model this, I use a single 20 megaton explosion. It actually underestimates the destruction that will take place, but it gives an adequate approximation. Within a thousandth of a second, a fireball would form, reaching out for two miles in every direction, four miles across. Within this area, the temperatures would be hotter than the surface of the sun, and everything would be vaporized. The buildings, the trees, the people, the upper level of the earth itself would disappear to a distance of four miles in every direction. Winds would exceed 600 miles per hour. The blast pressures would be greater than 25 pounds per square inch. Mechanical forces of that magnitude destroy anything that human beings can build. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that automobiles would melt. And to a distance of 16 miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Paper, cloth, wood, gasoline, heating oil, it would all ignite. Hundreds of thousands of fires, which over the next half hour would coalesce into a firestorm, 32 miles across, covering over 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperature would rise to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the oxygen would be consumed, and every living thing would die. In the case of New York, you're talking about 12 to 15 million people dead in a half an hour. And if this were part of a large-scale war between the United States and Russia, this level of destruction would occur in every major city in both countries. And if NATO were drawn into the conflict, most of the great cities in Canada and Europe as well. All told, perhaps 300 to 500 million people dead in a half a day. But these direct effects are only part of the story. The climate disruption that would follow from a large-scale war between the United States and Russia would be far greater than a more limited war in South Asia. We would effectively create a new ice age in a matter of days. Temperatures across the planet would fall an average of 14 degrees Fahrenheit. In the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperatures would drop 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. For three years, in the Northern Hemisphere, there would not be a single day free of frost. The temperature would go below freezing at least some point in every day. And under these conditions, all of the ecosystems which have evolved since the last natural ice age would collapse. Food production across the planet would stop. The vast majority of the human race would starve to death. And under these conditions, it is possible that we would become extinct as a species. Now, this is not just some nightmare scenario that cooked up to be, like, to be the plot of a movie. This is the danger that we live with every single day that these weapons exist. And the fact that we are here today is largely a function of the fact that we've been unbelievably lucky. We know of many instances when either Moscow or Washington actively began the process of launching their nuclear arsenals and stopped at the last minute when they discovered that they were not under attack as they thought they had been. On each of these occasions, it was not some wise policy that prevented nuclear war. Deterrence didn't work. It was actively abandoned by the decision to launch these weapons. What saved us was luck, pure and simple. And the current policy of maintaining nuclear arsenals forever is nothing more than a hope for continued good luck which is not an acceptable policy. We are living on thin ice. We don't know when our luck is going to give out. There is a great urgency about changing the situation fundamentally. We need to take the steps necessary to lower the risk that Daryl outlined, 
But we need to move very quickly beyond that to a fundamental commitment to eliminate these weapons. Now, fortunately, it is possible to do that. We saw in the 80s that we could build a political movement in a matter of just a few short years and transform the Cold War arms race, stop it, and reduce the nuclear arsenals by from something like 70,000 down to the current 15,000. We can do this again. But we need to have a plan. Internationally, the plan has been to rally support for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which seeks to stigmatize these weapons and to create an international climate in which the nuclear weapons possessing states need to take action and eliminate their arsenals. Here in the United States, we have launched a national campaign called Back from the Brink. It's modeled on the successful freeze campaign of the 1980s. It is based on a simple prescription of what US nuclear policy should be. There are five steps. Four of them involve the risk reduction measures that Daryl spoke to before, ending the policy of keeping our weapons on hair trigger alert, committing to no first use, ending the sole unchecked authority of the President of the United States to launch nuclear weapons by his or herself, ending the plan to spend 1.2, 1.7, whatever the figure is, trillion dollars on modernizing the nuclear arsenal. And then most importantly, the fifth point, committing the United States to entering now into negotiations with the other eight nuclear weapon states for a verifiable, enforceable, time-bound framework for dismantling the remaining 15,000 nuclear warheads in the world today. Those negotiations will not be easy. They are the step which must be taken in order for the United States and the other nuclear weapon states to be able to fully participate in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And this campaign, like the Freeze campaign before it, has really taken off in a kind of a viral way. We now have close to 200 entities, municipalities, state legislatures, civic organizations, religious communities around the country which have joined this campaign, have endorsed this policy prescription, and are working to build a national movement. And if we can get enough cities and towns and states and churches and rotary clubs and unions and professional associations all to endorse this and say this is what US nuclear policy needs to be, we will effectively create a national consensus that will give us the ability to force our leaders to make the policy changes, the fundamental policy changes that they need to make. This is really heavy stuff. It is really frightening to think about the danger that we face. No one of us, as Setsuko said, is going to solve this problem alone. But if all of us work together, we can solve this problem. We have done it before. And all we are saying is we need to do again what we have already done once before with regards to nuclear weapons. I want to just close by saying that while knowledge about this danger places a tremendous burden, tremendous responsibility on our shoulders, I think it also puts us in, posi in a position to do something very positive. Every one of us wants to make our life count. We want to do something good for the world. Those of us living today have been given the opportunity to save the world. And that is absolutely the best thing anyone can ever do with their life. So most of us here today are here because we are already concerned about this issue, want to take action. Let's use this day to figure out the work ahead, to recommit ourselves to this pro process. Um, I usually quote with a brief religious reference uh, it says in the book of Deuteronomy that God said, Behold, I have put before you life and death. Therefore, choose life that you and your children might live. That is literally the choice before all of humanity today. So let us choose wisely and let us act with determination and with perseverance and with courage so that indeed our children might live. Thank you. <laughs>